Good afternoon. Uh, oh, don't, you don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> um, OK, a couple preliminaries. Uh, first, a little background. Um, grew up in Richmond, Virginia. Went, to, went out to Pittsburgh, went to Carnegie Mellon, was a math computer science person. Worked for a company developing hospital computers for several years. And then made the mistake of playing golf with my father one day. I am a horrible golfer. I never play. And he says, your mother and I think you should uh, go back and get an MBA. And I said, ah, you know, I'm really not interested in that. I think I'd rather go to law school. And he said, so why don't you? And I said, ah, uh, I don't know. So I go home to my wife of six months, and I say, I'm thinking of quitting my job and going back to law school. Silence. Where'd you get that idea? Oh, Dad suggested it. You know, more silence. Are they going to pay for that? Oh, you know they can't afford. So one thing led to another. Uh, we were living um, outside Philadelphia. I uh, ended up going to Widener, which is in Delaware, and then went to Georgetown, got a master's in tax law. And then we decided to move out of that northeast kind of corridor. Is anyone familiar with that area? Anyone? OK, I-95. If I never drive on I-95 again, my life will be complete. Um, we wanted to move somewhere more conducive to raising a family. So my wife's whole family is in that Philly, New Jersey area. And she had four parameters as to where she was willing to move. Number one, smaller than Philly, which is really almost everywhere. Number two, warmer than Philly. I loved Pittsburgh. I would have gone back there in a minute. It was definitely colder than Philly. So that was off the list. East of the Mississippi, because her whole family was still in that eastern side, but she also insisted that we have a minimum of a three-hour buffer between her and her mother. Okay? So, basically, so, you know, I'm at Georgetown. We drew a line from Washington over to the Mississippi, so we're looking at the southeast quadrant, and a firm from Nashville came calling, and I was, oh, that's a four-point match. Warmer, smaller, east of the Mississippi, more than three hours from my mother-in-law. So we've been here almost 25 years. Okay, okay. Uh, number two, um, about 10, 15 years ago, I was giving a similar presentation and I got one of the nicest compliments I've ever received and hopefully you guys will feel the same way. It was a, after the presentation, a lady came up to me and she said, when I saw on the agenda that an attorney was talking, I thought it was going to be really boring, but it wasn't. And I said, uh, okay, I guess, thank you. Okay, so hopefully this will give you some information. Um, feel free to ask questions. I can hang around for a while afterwards. And uh, to start off, I'm going to kind of follow, follow up what Lynn said, is I've almost stopped telling people I do estate planning because I think they hear that and they say, Oh, well, I need to be rich like Bill Gates or Warren Buffett. I don't need that. So I've started telling people we do family wealth preservation because the idea is that people are working hard to accumulate the wealth they have, but we need to have a way to make sure that they keep it for their family, their children, their grandchildren, keep it for the people they care about and prevent outsiders being able to come in and get anything. Um, attorneys are like accountants and teachers, doctors, people who are licensed, realtors, often have to take continuing education hours. You have to go listen to someone talk uh, for a certain amount of hours. I often get called three, four times a year to teach other attorneys this stuff. And so what we, we start off by talking about what's the number one way we see families lose their wealth? What do you guys think? Taxes, that's usually the number one uh, comment. Number two, usually, usually people say health care. Okay? Those are bad, but I'm going to tell you a story that will demonstrate what we see as the number one problem with families, that we see families losing their wealth. About 20 years ago, I got a phone call from a lady who uh, lived outside D.C. in Virginia. And here's what she had to say. Um, I got a, my uh, 
My parents were married for 40 years. Mom died when she was her mid to late 60s. Dad got remarried, moved to Nashville with his new wife. They've been married about 15 years or so. Two months ago, I got a call from my stepmother. Your dad's not doing well. We don't know how much long he has. That was two months ago. A month later, we get a phone call. Your dad's passed away. Oh, and by the way, he changed his will, and he left everything to me and my children. So she's like, what, what can we do? And she starts telling me this story about how they were married when they were young, they had nothing, they built up a business, they sold it so they could spend more time with the children and the grandchildren. Unfortunately, a few years later, mom got sick, passed away, dad remarried a few years later. And so we, we, we talk about all the legal ramifications, and I say, well, was he maybe mentally incapacitated? No. Uh, well, did she use what we would call undue influence? Was he basically locked in the basement all the time, you know, until he signed the documents? No. So I, I said, I don't know what we can do for you. It's legally his stuff, and he can give it to anybody he wants. So that's the number one problem we see today. Second marriages, especially later in life, redirecting the wealth away from where the people want it to go. Okay, so you know, we're talking with clients, and you know, clients will come in, especially married couple, and say, we want a plan that says, oh, by the way, I also should tell you, I often usually get way ahead of my slides. So we'll, I'll probably talk for a bit, then we'll catch up on the slides. Um, People will come in and say, we want a plan that says when the first of us passes away, the survivor needs to have access and control of everything because it's our stuff, but we need to do it in a way where a new husband or wife can't come in and get anything. Now, this is not me being, oh, I also meant to also say this, as an attorney, I'm a nasty, horrible, paranoid, disbelieving person, so I just want to throw that out there. Statistically, husbands get remarried much sooner after a spouse dies. Last year, we had about eight clients get remarried between the ages of about 74 and 82. Okay? Were they getting remarried for undying, passionate love? I don't think so. I think it was as much for companionship. But they, don't, they didn't really understand the interactions between the marital rights and the inheritance rights. Um, so of those eight, seven of them were men, one was, a, one was a lady. My record is 92, getting remarried, okay? So, um, so, we're, so we're talking with the clients, and they say we want a plan that will um, allow the surviving spouse to have everything, but to prevent the surviving spouse from changing the plan and including a new husband or wife. Okay, we can do that. And then it's usually mom. Mom jumps up and says, well, if he died and I got remarried, I would never change my will to include a new husband, effectively taking things away from the kids and the grandkids. And I say, I've heard that before, but even if you don't, there's a law in Tennessee, and there's a similar law in almost every state. You cannot disinherit your spouse unless you have a prenuptial. Okay? So, I have three daughters. I die, my wife gets remarried. She has a will that says when she dies, everything goes to the kids. She dies later. Her husband can come into court, and the judge will ask him two questions. Were you married to her when she died? Yes. Did you sign away your marital rights in a prenuptial agreement? Uh, no, we didn't do that. End of discussion. He is now legally entitled to a portion of what would pass to the girls under my wife's will. Now, while every state pretty much has this law, they sometimes calculate the portions differently. And so here in Tennessee, if they were married for less than three years, even a day, 
he gets 10%. Three to six years is 20%. Six to nine years is 30%. And more than nine years is 40%. Okay, so let's say they're married 12 years. He's going to walk away with 40% of everything my wife and I have. And some of that might even have been things we inherited from our parents. And so my kids, my three kids, are going to divide up that remaining 60%. So mathematically, each of my children is going to end up with 20%. They're each going to get half as much as my wife's new husband. So the kids are like, Wait a minute, Judge. Moms will give it all to us. And the judge says, yeah, sorry about that. Law trumps will. And then the kids go, well, okay. You know, we didn't understand that, we, that there was this interaction between the marital and inheritance laws. We want it back when he dies. And the judge says, maybe. It's his. He can give it to anybody he wants. He can get remarried and give it to a new wife. He can give it to his kids from a prior marriage. He could give it back to my kids. How many times do you think in almost 25 years of doing this, someone came in and said, I was in a second marriage, my, my spouse had children from a prior marriage, when she died I inherited wealth that came through her parents and grandparents, but it came to me because that's how it was, you know, it was set up. How many times do you think someone said to me, and you know, if I don't spend it all before I die, I do want it going back to her children. One time. Usually it's, they didn't like me, we didn't have a relationship, their mother died six months ago, I haven't heard from them. You know, forget them, they're not getting anything. So again, most clients will come in and say, we want a plan that allows the survivor to have whatever he or she needs and wants, control it, but not in a way that they can change the plan to include the new spouse, and if possible, we want a plan that will defeat the spouse from being able to go to court and get their 10, 20, 30, 40%. Okay, so yes, we can do that. Okay, let me catch up here. Okay, so why do planning? Again, you're accumulating wealth, and sometimes I get snippy with clients and I tell them, when you pass away, your wealth is not going to simply dissipate into thin air. Someone is going to get the wealth that you worked hard to accumulate. Someone is going to be able to send their kids or grandkids to college and school. Someone's going to be able to take a vacation, go out to dinner, buy a car. And so, you need, if you care about, so I have had a few clients who have literally said to me, I truly do not care who gets this stuff when I die. So what do you think my response is? I have three children. <laughs> you know, if you, if you truly don't care, then we'll put, then I'll be your beneficiary. And then it's like, well, you know, that's not really what I meant. So it's like, well, right, so you do care. Um, and, 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 and oftentimes people care how the kids get the money and, and what they do with it. Okay, so who are we protecting the wealth for? You, your spouse, descendants, sometimes we have clients who don't have children, so they have nephews, nieces, brothers, sisters, parents, sometimes charities. We're protecting it from creditors, predators, so to me, a new husband or wife is a predator. I don't care if they cured cancer, they're still a predator. Creditors, predators, evil in-laws, sometimes we have to protect the money from or for the children or grandchildren themselves because they're just not well equipped to handle wealth and minimize taxes. So when we talk to clients about this, I sort of meant to break it down into two separate discussions. One is what I call emotional planning. Where, who is going, going to get it? How are they going to divide it up? The second is financial planning. How can we maximize what they get? Now, the reality is, especially in this environment, we focus more on the emotional, and this is why. Um, who here knows how much you can pass as a married couple free of tax uh, when you die, the estate tax exemption? Well, someone needs to know. Okay, it's about, it's, 
as of the new law from January, it's right around, per person, $11,200,000, okay? So a married couple can do $22,400,000. My children would be ecstatic if they had to pay a state tax, right? Because that means that they're getting at least $22,400,000 to divide up among themselves, okay? I die, my wife gets remarried. How much can, oh, so after the exemption amount, the tax rate is 40%, okay? I die, my wife remarries. How much can he get? Well, he can get it all. She can change her will, she can change a beneficiary designation, so I've got a retirement account, she's my beneficiary, I die, it rolls over into an account under her name, it's her account. She, does, she can name her new husband as her beneficiary. There's a house, she can put his name on the deed. So the reality is we're, we're more concerned about my wife's new husband taking things away from the kids than we are the IRS. Okay, so we talked about uh, creditors, predators, evil in-laws. So I'm going to jump ahead of the screen for a moment. So um, I'm sitting there at a meeting. I'm talking with a client. They have children that are adults, married, and I... Uh, some point in, in the meeting, I kind of lean over the table and I say, um, how do you like your son-in-law? And if they sit there and they go, um, I say, that's all I needed to hear. You know, you didn't jump out of your chair going, we actually love him more than our own daughter. And I have had a few people say that. Okay. So again, most clients will come to us and say, when we die and things pass to my daughter, I, if, if she die, if she, I'm sorry, if she gets divorced, I don't want the ex-son-in-law walking away with half the inheritance. Okay? Now, normally inherited wealth is not considered marital property for division, but there are many ways that innocently it can be converted from separate protected wealth to marital wealth. For instance, I'll give you two. My daughter gets a check from, you know, the inheritance. They write her a check. She's got to put it somewhere. Well, she and her husband have an account. You know, might as well just stick it in that account. She has instantly converted her separate protected money into marital joint money. So if they later got divorced, she does not have a legal argument to go back and say, oh, you know that account that's got $800,000 in it? Well, 600 of it came from my inheritance. I am going to do that back first, and then we'll, just, we'll divide the remaining 200. It doesn't work that way. She converted her separate money into marital. Okay? Here's another way that's a little more behind the scenes. Uh, she and her husband have a house that they own jointly. They have a mortgage on the house. She takes her inheritance and pays off the mortgage. They get divorced later. And she goes and says, well, you know that house that's worth 600000 of equity? 400 of that equity came from me using my separate protected money to pay off that mortgage. I want that back off the top, and then we'll divide the rest of the equity in the house. It doesn't work like that. So clients will come in and say, we want a way that when we're gone, and our children receive the wealth, we want a way so that if they got divorced, they don't have to share it with the ex-daughter-in-law or son-in-law. Okay? And you know, we love our son-in-law, but we don't know who she's going to be married to when she's 75. They, and that's not to say they get divorced, even though, as I said earlier, I am a horrible, nasty, disbelieving, paranoid attorney. Um, they could have the most wonderful 40-year marriage. And then he dies and she gets remarried. So most clients will come in and say, when we die and it goes to our daughter, when she dies, I want that to go to the grandchildren. I don't want it going to her husband, whoever that is. And maybe it's the guy that we adore, but then what happens with him? He gets remarried. And now my wealth that I worked hard to accumulate is in the hands of my son-in-law, which might be great because he's, he's wonderful, his new wife, her kids from a prior marriage, and my grandchildren. Usually at that point, clients go, nope, 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 stop, stop, stop. 
It needs to go from us to our children to our grandchildren. And then they say, and you know, one of our kids isn't great with money. Is there a way that we can protect the money from any of his creditors? Yes. We can have a plan that says when things pass from us to our children, it's done in a way that if my child ever had financial problems, creditors, maybe judgments, maybe they opened up a business and it didn't work out and they're, and they're personally obligated on some loans. They declare personal bankruptcy. There are ways to create the plan so that if the child, even if they declare personal bankruptcy, their creditors cannot get in and take away any of the inheritance. Okay? Okay, so again, we sort of, predators, new spouse. So when I talked about that 10, 20, 30, 40% that the new spouse can get, that's called electing against the will. Second marriages. Okay, to me, that is a time bomb waiting to happen. Because clients will often uh, say, we're in a second marriage, we have this certain lifestyle together, when we have kids from, from before, when we, we want the survivor to continue having that certain lifestyle that we have, but at the end, we want to divide things up a certain way. Now, maybe things like, it could be anything from half to my side, half to her side. And so if I have two kids and she has three kids, then my half will get divided two ways, her half gets divided three ways, okay? Or maybe it's, we're gonna treat all the kids, kids equally. I've got two, she's got three, it gets divided five ways. Or maybe she brought 80% of the wealth to the marriage and I brought 20. And so when we're gone, she, we want 80% of whatever's left over to go back to her kids and 20 to go to my kids. As opposed to not having anything in place where the survivor can dictate how things go, even to the point of cutting out everybody on the other side. So this brings up a uh, issue where people have this misconception that legally a spouse is entitled and receives everything when someone dies. And so they say, well, I don't need a will because as the spouse, I get everything. Well, that's not really true. And it often turns out that way, but that's not legally true. We're gonna, we're gonna show why in a minute. Okay, we talked about electing against the will, not able to disinherit your spouse, between 10 and 40%, depending on the length of the marriage. Evil in-laws, child spouse, child spouse's new spouse, death, divorce. If a child gets divorced, possibly lose 50% of the inheritance. You can still have the child control. So you've seen this word pop up a couple times. How do we, what's the, what's the answer, what's the solution to all these problems? It's to use a trust. A trust will put a wall around what you have and a wall around what you pass to the kids and the grandkids and prevent outsiders from being able to come in. So my wife and I have a trust. The trust says when one of us dies, the survivor has the ability to access everything, but the trust also says the survivor can't change the trust to include someone from outside the family. And then the trust goes on to say, after the last of the two of us die, then it'll be divided into trust for the kids. They can get and use whatever they need. But because it's in a trust, if my daughter gets divorced, her husband can't get anything. When my daughter dies, she can't give the inheritance and the trust to her husband. You know, whatever she accumulates for her own efforts, she can do whatever she wants to with. My stuff is going to stay in the family. And I pass away, I create a trust for my daughter, 
if she had creditor problems, has to declare bankruptcy, her creditors cannot get into the trust and take anything away. Why does this work? Because legally, the money is not hers. The money is mine, and I put it in a trust for her. And, it, and it's not just for her, it's for her, her children, her grandchildren. And because of that, and I can even let her be in charge of the trust, it's still going to be protected from outsiders. Okay, let's uh, pause for a moment. Let's talk about a trust. Because we get this question a lot. Where is the trust? And I have this smart aleck answer. It is everywhere, but nowhere. Okay? So a trust, a, a trust is sort of, is a thing, and, and sometimes a good analogy is a business. There are three main players in a trust. Number one, the grantor, the person who created the trust. If that trust is still around for great-grandchildren 120 years later, and that person died 80 years ago, they're still the grantor. A business analogy we, we use is um, Levi Strauss, you know, the blue jean company. There, I think there really was a guy, Levi Strauss, in the 18-somethings, created this company. He's obviously been dead for probably 100 years, but he was still the founder of that company, just like the grantor. Who created the trust? Then you have the trustee. That's the person in charge of the trust. Just like the president of the company, they get to make all the decisions about, well, we have to open a bank account. Uh, where do we go? We uh, buy that, sell that, distribute that. Totally in charge of all the decisions. So normally, when clients come in and they set up a trust, the clients are initially the grantors. The clients are also initially the trustee. You know, sometimes I think people hear the word trust and they go, oh, limitation, restriction. What am I giving up by putting something into a trust? Well, for the client, nothing. Well, I take that back. Only, there's only one thing the client is giving up. If one of them dies and the survivor remarries, the survivor cannot change the trust to include the new husband or wife. Most people do not think that is a huge restriction to give up. The third people are the beneficiaries. Who gets the benefit of what's in the trust? Again, that's the client. So initially, the client is the grantor, the trustee, and the beneficiaries. Because again, people think, if I put something in a trust, do I now have to get someone else's permission in order to use it? No, that's not true. So time goes on. Again, my wife and I die. There's a trust for my daughter. I'm still the grantor, because I will always be the grantor. My daughter and her descendants will be beneficiaries. And so again, these, um, it's not the case that only the lucky ones who are living when I die are beneficiaries. Even people who come later. So if my daughter has more children after I die, when her trust is created, they can become beneficiaries also. Later on, my daughter has grandchildren. They are all going to be beneficiaries of the trust. I can even let my daughter be trustee. That's kind of the Marie Antoinette plan. She has her cake and eats it too. She can be totally in charge of the trust, meaning she's in charge of handling the money and using it, just as if I had given it to her directly. But because it's inside the trust, no one can get to it. So she wants to buy a condo at the beach. We would tell her, you need different parents because we don't have enough money to give our kids you know, a, a condo at the beach. But if there was, we would tell her, have the trust buy the condo. Don't take money out of the trust into your name and go buy the condo. A trust can own almost anything a person can own. A trust can own real estate, bank accounts, CDs, investments, 100 shares of IBM stock, a mutual fund, a life insurance policy, uh, a business interest. It can own a business. So we, we tell people, or we tell their kids, only take something out of your trust if you're going to consume it, actually spend it, which is you're going to eat it, drink it, wear it, drive it, vacation it, or educate it. If, let's say the trust has $600,000 in it and she wants to go buy a condo, 
Well, the trust has wealth. It just happens to be represented by cash. She goes and buys a condo in the trust. Well, the trust still has wealth. It's just now manifested in the form of real estate. She hasn't spent anything. She hasn't consumed anything. Ten years later, when they sell the condo, the check gets written to the trust. It goes into a trust account. And then she decides what next to do with it. So again, don't take the money out of the trust into your name because now someone can get to it. And all the protection that the trust provided evaporates. Is everyone still awake? I know, I know right after lunch, the food coma starts to set in. Okay, again, child's remarriage. Again, we want to make sure that things stay in the family. Okay, so, uh, okay, I, I have neglected, I usually tell a lot more stories. Um, so we're gonna take a break at around five o'clock, and the second half of the seminar will go till about 11. Um, um, okay, so story number you know, 173. Client comes to me, and um, he and his wife have inherited land outside of Nashville. They've got about 100 acres. It's been in the family since the 1800s. They have two daughters. One was previously married and has a child, so she's divorced, not married. Daughter number two was never married. So they come to me and they say, um, we, my, the daughter number one is getting remarried, so daughter number one is going to have a second marriage, and daughter number two is getting married for the first time. They're having a double wedding, and they, he says, I want you to do prenuptial agreements for these guys. And they say, we don't really care what they say other than these guys will never get an interest in this family land. And I say, okay, we can do that. But just even off the top of my head, I see several problems with that. Number one, in order, one of the ways to break a prenuptial is to do it right before the wedding. The wedding was in like six weeks. These people should have come in six months ago because the, if the guys sign it right before the wedding, they can come back later and say, well, I signed it under duress. They told me, you know, the wedding wouldn't happen if I didn't sign this. Number two, uh, a prenuptial is a contract between the daughter and her fiancé. Who's to say they don't sign it, go out in the car and tear it up? No one would know. And number three, and I think this is what they found most disturbing, who's going to be around to make sure that whenever a daughter maybe gets remarried, there's always someone there to have make sure a prenuptial is done beforehand? So I said, forget the prenuptial idea. We're going to change your estate plan and incorporate a trust for the girls. So when the two of you die, the land will go into a trust for them, and they can have access to it, and if they decide to sell it, the... the the money will come into the trust, but it will be protected for them. And it won't matter who they're married to. It won't matter in a divorce. It won't matter whether or not they have a prenuptial. The trust will make sure that it stays protected. So that's what they did. Sometimes we have clients who just aren't good with money and the idea is that they don't want them to get a whole pile of money you know, at, a, at a time. This is especially um, with younger couples who have younger kids or parents about grandkids. So again, we get a lot of clients who come over and say, I have certain expectations of my kids, grandkids. I expect them to be productive members of society. I expect them to be able to stand on their own two feet financially. I don't want my grandson at the age of 29 sitting on the couch playing video games and, and all the, my hard work that I use to accumulate this wealth is subsidizing that lifestyle or you know, skiing in Colorado for a month and calling up and saying, hey, I need $50,000 because the gang's going down to Miami Beach. So again, the trust can work in a way so that the wealth is there if they need it but it's not somehow a disincentive of get an education, have a job, that sort of thing. Now, there are also some beneficiaries 
who because of their maybe physical or mental disability qualify to receive governmental assistance. TenCare, Medicaid, Medicare, Social Security, something like that. Sometimes that qualification is what's called, called resource based. They don't have very much wealth and therefore they qualify to receive uh, the assistance. If they inherit a bunch of money, they no longer qualify and they'll get kicked off. So there's something called a special needs trust that can be set up so that the money, their, their, their inherited wealth can be held for them, can be used for them, but not in a way that would end up disqualifying them from continuing to receive the governmental assistance. Okay, so how do we protect wealth for the family? Do not give anything to someone directly. Okay, so you know, maybe $5,000 to my nephew or $10,000. I'm not overly concerned about that. We used to see a lot of documents prepared by other, other lawyers that said, when we die, give it to my kids, but put it in a trust, and when they get to be 25, give them a third. When they get to be 30, give them another third. And when they get to be 35, just give the rest to them. And so when we're meeting with the clients you know, years later, they're looking to redo their documents, I say, huh, that's interesting. How'd you come up with those ages and percentages? Oh, that's what the attorney suggested. Okay. Um, you know, while the money is in the trust, it's protected. After age 35, it's all going to be out of the trust. I have heard rumor that people get divorced after age 35. And I've heard rumors that people have financial difficulty after age 35. So I'm not a big fan of having these staggered distributions. We, have, we prefer to do what's called a dynasty trust. It, is, it would be in trust for my daughter's lifetime. And then when she dies, it continues on in trust for the, her kids. Okay, so creditor protection, divorce protection, protection from future spouses. Okay, Tennessee is one of the states that is at the forefront of trust law. We are generally considered the third best state in the country for trust laws. We have lots of different trusts that other states don't have. Trust that you create during your lifetime, other trusts that will be created for other people upon your death. Preserve, this is what we've been talking about the whole time, preserving the family wealth for several generations. Protect from creditors. So, so Tennessee is one of the few trusts in, states in the country where you can set up a trust for yourself and protect it from your creditors. What we talked about previously was it's very easy to create a trust to protect it for my children. In the past, it was very difficult to create a trust for myself and protect it from creditors. Because what happened was, um, if I created a trust for myself, I had control of that trust, I could use the money anytime I wanted, then the courts would say, come on, it's just like it's still in your own checking account. Well, several states changed their laws about 20 years ago in Alaska was the first one to do this, to say, we will let you create a trust. You can have a large amount of control over how that money is invested and used, how it comes out to you and your family. But under state law, we will prevent your creditors from being able to get anything. Okay, So Tennessee was one of the first states to do this. And there's maybe eight, 10 states in the country that allow this. More types of trusts. We're going to talk about this one also in a minute. Trusts that work to reduce future capital gains tax. Trusts that work to reduce estate tax. So, you know, um, 22 million 400 is a lot for the federal tax exemption. Under the, uh, the way the law is written, in 2027, that number is going to get divided in half. And it's going to go down to 11 million, about 11 million for a couple. And just as a frame of reference, 
During the 2016 presidential campaign, the Democratic platform had it at $7 million for a couple. Okay? More frame of reference. About 20 years ago, the exemption amount was around $750,000. Trust that work to avoid probate. So, one of the main purposes of, that many people will use what's called a revocable trust is to avoid probate. People do not want to go through probate. People hear horror stories of going through probate. I will tell you, here in Tennessee, it's not that bad. If we can avoid it, we would prefer to. But places like California, Illinois, Florida, New York, it is horrendous and very expensive to go through probate. Here in Tennessee, there is a cost, but it's not like you hear about these other states. Like sometimes you'll hear a story that it costs 10% of what the total value of the estate to go through probate. That is not the case here in Tennessee unless you're in a nasty dispute and a lot of the fees are going to the lawyers, which actually I'm in favor of. Um, but other than that, it, it just as it naturally doesn't do that. Trust that help if you become incapacitated. Again, a revocable trust will help with this. We have, we have seen uh, recently that if someone becomes incapacitated, it's much easier to, for someone to step in and handle their wealth, their assets for them, pay bills, things like that, if they have their money in a trust. So I'll give you an example. Last December, we got a phone call from a lady uh, her mother was in the Alzheimer's wing of the nursing home, and she needed access to the bank account in order to pay the nursing home bill. Well, uh, the bank was denying her access. So what she didn't understand is that she needed a letter from the doctor certifying that her mother was incapacitated mentally, which wasn't a problem because she was in the Alzheimer's wing. And once they got that, then they would let her have access. The problem, though, was they then said, we need a statement from you, daughter, every 60 days, declaring like an affidavit, swearing that this power of attorney is still in effect and no one has revoked it. Well, I mean, her mother's incapacitated. She can't revoke it. But they said that's, that's our policy and procedure. So every 60 days, she has this form that she has to fill out, sign and get notarized, and send it. Now, almost as a throwaway comment, the financial institution said, you know, if your mom had done a trust, we wouldn't, have to, we wouldn't be asking for any of that. All we need is the letter from the doctor, the page of the trust that shows that you're in charge now, and then we step out and you never hear from us again. So we're finding that for whatever reasons, using a power of attorney to have someone come in and help manage assets is becoming more difficult than having it in the trust. Okay, trust can provide charitable benefits, special needs, pass on the ethics. That's kind of like what we talked about, how parents don't necessarily want their kids or grandkids to not have to go to school or not work because they're going to get a bunch of wealth. Okay, this is my favorite bullet point of the entire presentation. You need to execute the documents while you're living. Okay, that should sound kind of obvious. We get this conversation, we get this phone call two or three times a year. Oh, Mr. Heller, my husband and I came and saw you, you know, three years ago. We didn't do anything. He's passed away. We like one of those uh, trusts now. Hmm. Doesn't work that way. We kind of need you here to sign it. Now, that doesn't mean that we couldn't do a different trust for the survivor, but if you want one of these trusts that is specifically for a married couple, it's very difficult to do that after one of them is gone. Okay, so this kind of brings us up to the question of how the trust works and how we get things into the trust. And to do that, we have to understand how things pass when you die. And this goes directly back to my earlier comment 
where people just seem to have a misconception that under the law, the surviving spouse gets everything. Okay. When someone passes away, we can categorize their assets in one of four groups. Beneficiary designation, like a life insurance policy or a retirement account. I may have a life insurance policy beneficiary that says, my daughter, Sarah. And then I may have a will that says, has a paragraph that says, all my life insurance to my daughter, Catherine. Who gets it? Sarah's going to get it. I have a contract with that life insurance company. And that contract says, I pay them a certain amount of money each year as, an, as a premium. Their part of the contract is... They will pay this amount of money to these designated, identified, listed people. And part of that contract is, if I ever want to change who those people are, I have to submit their form to them. Okay? There are court cases about, well, he wrote on a sticky, uh, you know, changed my beneficiary. Or maybe even got the form, filled it out, but then stuck it in the desk. Doesn't count. Number two. Jointly owned assets. This is specifically for married couples. When you own something, uh, whether it's an account, a house, it's, uh, there is embedded in that ownership something called a right of survivorship. My wife and I are on the deed for the house together. I die, it's hers. I could have a provision in my will that says it goes to the kids. Inoperable, doesn't matter. We had a case years ago, uh, uh, later in life, Second marriage couple, they bought a house together. It was deeded in both their names. She had a will that said when she dies, her half of the house goes to her kids. She died first. Her kids came in. They tried to kick him out of the house. We got hired on the side of righteousness and justice to represent the husband. And we basically had to tell the kids, it's not your house. The right of survivorship that was embedded in their joint ownership trumps whatever the will says. Number three. A trust. You have a trust, you put things in your trust, then that document will have the details of how things get divided up and how it gets handled. And so the will, to me, is really nothing more than a catch-all. If something doesn't pass by beneficiary designation, by joint ownership, by a trust, then the will will direct where it goes. So especially when we have younger couples, almost everything they have is a beneficiary designated item, or joint ownership, which means we never have to use the will, but it gives the inappropriate appearance that legally the spouse isn't, gets everything that, that the first one had. That's not true. It just happens to work out that way. So the will really only catches three things. Something you own in your name by yourself. Something you own jointly with someone who's not your spouse. Um, this gentleman, Mike, is diligently taking notes. Mike and I are not married. We own this building. He owns 70%. I own 30%. Mike dies. His 70% will go by way of his will. My 30% will go by way of my will. The third way that the will gets pulled in, and we don't like to see this, is sometimes up at the first one, the beneficiary designation will say my estate. And that just means whatever that asset is, it's going to roll down and the will will direct where it goes. Now, when we talk about probate, that's the will. These items one, two, and three, they do not go through probate. Only the will goes through probate. So if we want to avoid probate, we want to have our assets structured so it passes by beneficiary designation, joint ownership, or by a trust. Now, if we want to have the protection that the trust provides, these numbers one and two have to fold into the trust. I have a um, life insurance policy. My wife is the beneficiary. I change that so that the trust is the beneficiary. Because if my wife gets the money directly, her new husband can get to it. If instead, the insurance goes into the trust. Well, she's the trustee by herself. She gets to use how much ever she wants. But because it's in the trust, new husband can't get to it. Okay. What if you don't have a will? 
It goes by intestate succession. Again, this goes to the misunderstanding that the surviving spouse gets everything. If husband and wife have no children, it goes to the spouse. If there's one child, spouse and child divide it 50-50. If there's two or more children, the spouse gets a third, and the children get two-thirds. Now, uh, years ago, I was meeting with a client. He had a bunch of businesses that he owned in just his own name. And, I, and, they didn't, and he and his wife didn't have, will, have wills because she said, well, it's going to come to me anyway because it's our business. Well, it's not your business because he owns it legally in just his name. And I said, here's how it's going to work. He dies, and they had three, at the time they had three teenage daughters. He dies, you're going to own one-third of these businesses, and the three teenage daughters are going to own two-thirds of the businesses. And his wife said, and we were meeting at their house. Well, he will have a will before you leave the house today. I said, well, it doesn't exactly work that way, but we can do it quickly. Okay, we're going to talk briefly about two of the special types of trusts that we have here in Tennessee. One is called a TIST, a Tennessee Investment Services Trust, and this is the asset protection trust that you can have here in Tennessee. As just, uh, for instance, I've got a client who owns um, a couple nursing homes. He is convinced that he will get sued at some point, probably correctly. Some will be unhappy with how, you know, grandma or pop pop was treated. And every year, so he and his wife have an asset protection trust, and every year they just carve off something, they put it into the trust, so that if everything went to crap, they have things that are locked away. Another thing that we've been doing recently with this is business owners, closely held business owners. They have maybe have 100 shares of stock. We convert them to maybe two shares of voting stock, 98 shares of non-voting stock, and then we lock away the voting stock in an asset protection trust. So if they ever got sued by somebody, no one would ever be able to get control of their company. Okay. The last trust I want to talk about is now our generally our go-to trust for a married couple. It's called a Tennessee Community Property Trust. And so what this allows is, is everyone familiar with getting a step up in basis when someone dies? Maybe, sort of, okay. My dad buys something at 10. It goes up to 100. He sells it. Like anybody, he would have gain of 90 that he would have to pay tax on. But instead, he buys it at 10, it goes to 100, he dies. I inherit it at 100. It goes to 120. I sell it. What's my gain that I have to pay? 20. I get a step up in basis. So who pays the gain of 90 that accumulated during my dad's lifetime? Nobody, right. It evaporates. This is one of the few freebies the IRS gives us. Do they do it because they are a kind, empathetic organization? They know that we've lost someone near and dear to us? No. It's because mostly that, from an administrative standpoint, it, you know, Dad bought that 30, they, they want me to take my dad's original 10. Dad bought that 40 years ago. How am I supposed to know what he, what he paid for it? So, we get a step up in basis. When a married couple owns something, like, uh, it could be an investment portfolio. It could be a piece of real estate, a business. When a married couple owns something together and the first of them dies, the survivor gets a step up for that half. Okay? Uh, ba, 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 ba. I don't see a mark. Oh, yeah. Okay. Can you guys see this at all over here? Okay. So, someone, there's a house. They bought it for $200,000. See if we can, there we go. This is the husband. That's the wife. They each own 50%. So their basis, half of 200 is 100. House goes, increases over time to 500. Husband dies. Wife inherits his 50%. Her step-up basis, 
50% of 500, 250. Wife decides to sell that house. What's her basis? Well, she thinks that she, emotionally, she thinks she owns the whole 100%, which she does. But to the IRS, she owns two separate 50% portions. She owns the portion that she originally acquired that has the $100,000 basis, and she has the inherited portion that has this step up of 250. So when you add them together, her basis is 350, which means she has 150,000 of gain that she would have to pay tax on. So this new trust, and when I say new, it's about eight years old here in Tennessee, says even the survivor's portion will get a step up in basis to 250, which means zero capital gains tax paid. Okay? This works for anything that has gain, a business interest, real estate, investments, so again, this is something that Tennessee is one of the few states that has this. And it's actually designed so that people who do not live in Tennessee, you know, like you live in Kentucky or something, could still utilize this simply by having a Tennessee trustee. Well, so throughout the state, you can still have Tennessee trustee. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, then, so we've been talking about my estate. People say, well, what's in my estate? Everything, okay? And here's where there's a disconnect. Sometimes people say, well, if it doesn't go through probate, it's not part of my estate. That's not true. Probate is just the method of transferring some of your assets, but everything is going to be part of your estate. So, basic estate planning documents, revocable trust. So you still have a will, even though your trust is the main document that says here's how uh, you know, things are gonna be divided and distributed, you still have what's called a pour over will. And what that will says is, uh, I've got this trust, and I'm pretty sure I put everything into it. But just in case I missed something or I forgot something, go stick it in my trust. That's really all it says. We hope we never have to use it. We don't want to use it because we want everything to be in your trust. And then we have durable power of attorney, and then we have health care documents, living will, power of attorney, medical directives. Okay, here's kind of a review. Non-tax reasons. We haven't even talked about taxes. Non-tax re or estate taxes, non-tax reasons. Protect from a new spouse. Protect from a child's divorce. For protect from a child's spouse, protect from misuse. As you might have figured out by now, I think a trust is the answer to most problems short of world hunger and fossil fuel use. Okay, questions? Okay, yes sir. Yes, so there are trusts that you can create, put your assets into, that will not be counted against you for nursing home, 10 care qualification. Five year look back, okay? Now, I would tell you, we ha I'm not big fans of that, because in order to qualify for 10 care to pay for you to be in the nursing home, you have to basically impoverish yourself. I mean, you really can't have more than maybe like $3,000 to your name, and you can have a house. And then the other thing we caution people is you don't get to pick which nursing home you go to. Different nursing homes have different allocation of 10 care beds, and they will try to find a nursing home in the area geographically that is acceptable to you and your family. And we've had clients or families that have said they don't think they got the best care in a 10 care bed at a nursing home. So while yes, we can do that, we just caution clients in for the sake of passing on wealth to the kids, is your, is, are you gonna have the kind of care you, you want to have? 
So you don't get to pick the $15,000, you know, exclusive nursing home if the state of Tennessee is paying for it. But the short answer is yes, you can do that. Mm -hmm. It does because it's revocable. You would have to there's a, yeah you would have to set up a special irrevocable trust, transfer your things into that trust. You can't be a beneficiary. You can't be the trustee. You're basically giving it away to the kids, and trusting that that if you do need some of that money, they'll pull it out and give it to you, because it can't be your money anymore. Sure. Part of your money yep. Yep. And we do that a lot. Yep. Yes, ma'am. If you have property in several states, mm -hmm. the trust protects the property. You do not have to go through probate if you have. Yes, to that's a that's a, that's a good point. A lot, you know, if if you have real estate, like at the beach, then it is important that I do a due diligence due diligence visit for about a week. <laughs> okay, every year. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Indiana, maybe two days. Right. Um, no, but that's a good point because if you have property out of state, then you will have to do what's called ancillary probate, an entire separate probate proceeding in that state in order to be able to transfer the, the real estate. By putting it into a trust, and you put it into a trust by a simple, what's called a quick claim deed, by putting it into the trust, you do not have to go through probate in those other states. Yes, sir. Yes, or or mostly. Mm -hmm. Now remember, you're still going to control the trust. I understand, but mm -hmm. that, the way I understood it from somebody was that if you did that, your, your bank accounts and everything would be in the name of the trust. And if you wanted any money, you, you instead of writing the check on your own checking account, you're writing it on the trust account. Yep. Is so that right? yeah. So you're going to have a checking account, and the only difference is the top of the check is going to say, you know, the the Mr. Jones Trust, as opposed to just saying Mr. Jones. But you can write a check. There, there's there's no limitation or restriction on how you use, spend, distribute, write a check, any of that. Would be if, when you, if you're using your checking account, uh, you would be using you'd just be writing it on a, on a on the trust account. Right. You, you're, you're, you're just you're just picking up a different checkbook. And then what about credit cards and things like that? Doesn't matter. Same thing. Mm -hmm. It does, but th that doesn't exist when you put it into the trust. We break those. Because now the trust. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, the question was how how is tenants by the entireties, which is the technical name when when a married couple owns something, and tenants in common when that's how that's how Mike and I own this building. Tenants in common. We're just two people who have a partial interest in some real estate. When you put it into the trust, none of that exists. The trust owns it a hundred percent. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Does it matter um, what rate, is your rate, like if you're a resident of New Hampshire, we own property and we use many things. We're here in Tennessee now, we might be somewhere else next year. Does it matter where it's established in there? The trusts, trusts are designed to be transportable. So if you created a trust here as a resident of Tennessee, you could have property from different places in the trust, and if you moved around, you don't have to have your trust rewritten like you would possibly a will every time you move to a different state. So then, what's the best state for you? Uh, Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was, was that a trick question? Best state for me to get <laughs> Tennessee. So let me put it this way: Tennessee has certain trusts that will allow people who don't live in other states to be to use. That is rare. Okay, now. 
Um, okay, it's quarter after one. If anyone has to leave, you will not insult me. You would not be the first person who got up and left in the middle of while I was talking. Okay, <laughs> but I, I so I but I can hang around and ask and answer questions. Um, the reason why Tennessee allows other people to come in who don't live here to create trust is not is purely a mercenary money making. It, it was the financial institutions said, we, how do we convince people who don't live here to bring their money here? Well, let's come up with all these kind of innovative trust laws to help protect people and give good tax benefits. And let's make it in a, in a way where even if you don't live here, you can take advantage of our laws. Most states do not let that. Mo I'm going to say most, probably no more than four or five do. Yes, sir. Okay. You, you okay? So, someone owns a part. Someone owns a, an interest in a partnership. You would transfer that into your trust. So now your trust owns the partnership, not you personally. Now, sometimes a partnership document will have some type of restriction on transfer. So you might need to get the permission of the other partner in order to transfer. So most of the trusts that we've been talking about are what we would call revocable trusts. They are going to be uh, what I would call tr transparent to the IRS. Anything that happens in that revocable trust is going to go on your 1040 just like you owned it yourself. So there's going to be no positive or negative impact by putting things into a revocable trust. It's going to be, the IRS isn't even going to see it. But from a partnership standpoint, it, it makes no difference. Um, so the alternative to doing a trust is just doing a simple will. The trust is just more involved because you have to now take the step of identifying your assets and then getting them moved into the trust. You would have to open up a new investment account in the name of the trust. You would have to have deeds done to transfer the property into the name of the trust. With a will, you don't do any of that. You just do a will. Now, the reality is when you die later, all that stuff is going to happen anyway. So it just puts more legwork on you on the front end as opposed to the family on the back end. But in your daily life, if you borrow money nope. or whatever, yep. trust, it doesn't affect anything. Nope, not at all. Isn't there also a stipulation in a Tennessee community property trust that you can't get a divorce? You can still get a divorce. You can get a divorce. Mm -hmm. Sure. I thought that was That'd be like a, like a new kind of prenuptial agreement <laughs> where you know if you get this trust, you can't get divorced. You can get divorced. You, so you can get divorced, but it may, it may change how the property is divided up. Yes, sir. Well, again, the tr when you put something in the trust, like an investment account, it's going to go under your own social security number. So it's, it's, there's going to be no disconnect. Uh, the trust itself will not be taxed because it's all going to flow to your 1040 just like you owned it yourself because everything's still going to be associated with your uh, social security number. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So my, if my wife and I have a trust. We have an investment account in there. It generates $10,000 of interest. That account will still have either my social or my wife's social attached to it. We get a 1099 under that social. It goes on our 1040 just as if it was still in our own name. Yes, ma'am. Is there any difference between citizens and non-citizens as far as the trust is concerned? The exemptions? Yes. Like that? <laughs> wow, that's a, that's a, that's a. I'm German, so. <laughs> Well, there's, there's a difference between it's, it's not a citizen, it's a non-resident alien. Okay. So if you are a resident alien, you are still subject to all the tax laws. Okay. But if you are a non-resident alien, then you do not get nearly as much uh, tax exemption. Okay. 
Because as a resident alien, if you own things in Germany, mm -hmm. that will be taxed. Right. Because you know you are availing yourself to the laws of the United States of America. Anything you have, no matter where it is in the world, will be subject to the estate tax. Right. That's not the case for a non-resident alien, so you get a lot less benefit from the tax law. Yes, sir. Yes, it becomes irrevocable when you die. Correct. Now, irrevocable. The question is, can an irrevocable trust be changed? The answer is yes. It's it's now uh, under under some new tax laws. Again, Tennessee is trying to be very uh, flexible with trust law. You can change an irrevocable trust. All it takes is for everyone to get together and agree. The trustee and the family, as everyone can agree, then we can change an irrevocable trust. Um, and we actually do that fairly often. Um, because the kids will get together and say, we would kind of prefer it work this way, add these extra layers of protection. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Well, in an irrevocable trust, um, the uh, gains you have on uh, whatever your investment, how is that reported to the IRS? Okay. okay. At the, uh, so I'm going to oversimplify this for the accounting people in the, in the room. Okay. I'm going to rephrase your question. If, I, if the trust makes a distribution out to me or out to, out to my kids, is everything that comes out of the trust going to be taxed? Okay, the answer is no. So in general, if the trust makes $5,000 of income and then hands it out to a beneficiary, then that $5,000 will get reported on the tax return of the beneficiary that received it. Okay? Let's say the trust made $5,000 total but handed out $15,000. Generally, that extra 10 is going to be just a distribution of principal, what was originally put into the trust. That is generally not an income tax event. So basically what that means is everything that comes out of the trust is not necessarily going to be taxed to the person who receives it, only the income element of that distribution. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay, yes, with two possible caveats. I don't care and worry about your cars. Most people don't put their cars in, in a trust. The other thing I don't get too bent out about is your day-to-day -day checking account. Most people don't have a couple hundred thousand dollars sitting in their day-to-day -day checking account. And if you want to move it into the trust, you can't just move it into the trust. You have to open up a new account with a new number in the name of the trust, which means, from a practical standpoint, whatever electronic banking you have connected to that previous account would have to be redone. So if you're getting a Social Security check, you got to go deal with the Social Security to people. people that stops most people right there from, you know, from wanting to you know, change it. If you're doing online banking and automatic withdrawals, you'd have to redo all that. So most people don't worry too much about their day-to-day -day checking account and don't worry about the cars. But other than that, pretty much everything either needs to be in the trust or at least pointed into the trust like a life insurance policy. Uh, doesn't matter because there is actually a separate process here in Tennessee for transferring the title in the car without having to go through probate. So that's easy to do. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, not. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, there there isn't. You're the trustee. Usually the only, I mean, the only fee is if you had to pay a trustee, but you're the trustee of your own trust. No. Sure. 
Um, so I'll t briefly, the way we charge is we charge by the project, not by the hour. We want to have long-term relationships with clients. I don't charge for phone calls. I don't charge for emails. You know, someone calls me up six years from now with a question. They don't get a bill in the mail. Um, you know, um, Mike, I'm going to keep picking on you. Mike calls me up. He says, hey, I'm buying another piece of prop real estate. Uh, how do I put that in the trust again? And my response is, eh, just tell me who's doing your closing. We'll send them a copy of, you know, the trust or whatever they need. It doesn't, even, you know, it, it takes me longer to put into my billing system that I talk to Mike on the phone, I send someone an email, and then I have to look at the bill and review it and then worry about whether Mike sent me $150. I get better things to do with my allocation of time than that. So we charge by the project. So it, it kind of depends on your situation, but it usually costs between $2,500 and $5,000. Just depends on how involved it is and what, else, what you're trying to do with it. Yes? Again, if you set up the trust for me, when I die, then what happens? Then your people generally need to come see us, but it could be any attorney to help them with the process. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't put the... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know why you would want to go through probate in Tennessee if you didn't have to. Everything you own in your own name. So, we'll go through probate if it's not in the trust. Unless you had like a, de a beneficiary designation to it. Okay, okay, so you can do that, but that also means, so you're giving beneficiary designations to individual people, right? That means you're not using the trust to protect them and the money that they're getting. So that means, that goes back to the beginning of the presentation, a divorce could touch it, a creditor could touch it, a spouse could touch it. If you wanted to protect it for the kids, you would have to funnel it through the trust and not give it to them directly. Uh oh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're finding more and more that that's more di that people are are disrespecting, for lack of a better term, POAs than they used to. In general, I mean, it's just, it's, it's the financial institutions. It's not, you know, it's Bank of America or actually one of the problems we have was with Fifth Third Bank. Is anyone here from Fifth Third Bank? I should have asked that before I before I said that. Um, so it's not Tennessee, it's the banking financial organizations. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay, we get that question a lot. And so I will tell you, I have some clients that have $150,000, $200,000. I've got other clients that have $80 million. And it really just depends on, and I know this is going to sound preachy, do they value the idea of protecting who gets the wealth when they die and when kids die later? So, I mean, I've got clients with, again, $150,000, $200,000 they worked hard for. They want to make sure that if they die and their wife gets remarried, her new husband can't get any of this and it'll go to the kids. So the answer is no. There really isn't a kind of monetary level that, um, you, if you're, that you're too low under. It really just depends on your attitude about how much you value the wealth you have. I think you've got to consider, too, that it's not just the wealth you have, but life insurance proceeds. Yep. You may only have $50,000, but you can have a million-dollar life insurance policy. So 
and, and if you might inherit something. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think my information, if you guys have questions, feel free to call. We're always happy to help, even just to answer questions. Just let us know.